we were talking about before about the the drought. Um, I mean, the the photos speak for themselves. The water's not there, and uh, the snowpack in Colorado is not there, and so the consequences flow straight down. Uh, to the extent that Santa Fe is shifting from local water to imported water from the San Juan Chama system, and that actually gives us a hedge because the San Juan Chama uh, system is not as um, affected yet by the ongoing dryness. So, you know, the San Juan Chama project takes water through pipelines out of the San Juan Chama system and pumps it over and dumps it into the Rio Grande, and um, that gives us somewhat of a hedge. But it's short term, and I mean, I'm not sure what to say in terms of addressing it, other than you know, we're working on cutting down agricultural consumption and trying to find new efficiencies because this is the new reality about well, what, water well, scarcity. The reason I'm saying is at the Buckman meeting this past week, the city council members, as well as specifically the county commissioners, didn't even respond with not even with any type of concern whatsoever, which was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And so when our local officials are not addressing these significant water affairs, which um, some of our cit citizens are having to go out to bring the story to light, and yet they say, next please, without making a comment, there's a concern that they are not addressing the serious issues where we are with water like they should be. Mm -hmm. I, I, and a lot of citizens feel that. It, we're not being told the true story. It's not being put in the paper. There's a twist on it. But what happens when the tap quits flowing? And we're in a very severe situation with that potentially happening. And it, to, to have them ignore it and blow it off as impertinent to even make a comment about is, uh, is, am is amazing. Yeah, so uh, there was concerns that uh, the city councilors and, and county commissioners that comprised the Buckman Direct Diversion Board uh, weren't uh, paying attention or, or aware of lack of supply uh, at upstream locations and the impact that might have on their ability to do the Well, they diversions. haven't even visited. They they were clueless. Yeah, I mean, so. yeah, I, I think you're not unreasonable to be concerned, concerned about water scarcity. Um, I personally, I mean, I don't serve on the board. This is a, you know, it's a local project and although I'll end up drinking the water, I don't day-to-day -day well, well, we can't going get up. any response with our locals. We're trying to go up the ladder to say who yep. is going to bring some awareness and look at this in a responsible manner. Yep. We've, at the, and I've done this twice and this might be an instance where we want to do it again. We've done we have these things called memor memorials in the legislature. They're not laws but they request that, that certain things great. happen. And we did one with the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration on their uh, memorandum. It's joint oper it was either joint operating agreement or memorandum of understanding where they were dragging their feet getting the radionuclide testing protocols and funding in place for the stormwater runoff for the Buckman out of the Los Alamos canyons. And uh, we got the memorial passed, and really it was like the. I'm told, you know, I'm not in the Buckman office, so I don't know, but I'm told that within days uh, the feds were back online and they got the agreement in place that was drafted to the satisfaction of the Buckman board. Uh, so we may be able to try that again in terms of, you know, what are their forecasts for how do you, how do you address scarcity of water upstream? That would be great. Yeah. I'm kind of segueing off of what you just said. I, I'm Jay Cogman with the Watch New Mexico. I'll, I'll try to. Um, I'm Jay Cogman with uh, Nuke Watch New Mexico, and uh, to touch upon water issues in Los Alamos, um, another demerit on the Martinez administration is, as you know, there's a uh, consent order in place since uh, 2005 uh, between the state and NNSA uh, regarding cleanup. Uh, at the laboratory, um, but the Martinez administration has um, unilaterally extended uh, more than 30 cleanup milestones um, and has extended them by two years uh, when cleanup, at least on paper, is supposed to be uh, completed by the end of uh, 2015. 
So obviously to extend these 30 major milestones uh, by two years, um, in effect it guts this uh, consent order. Um, and what my question uh, becomes, um, what can you and, and your colleagues uh, within the State House uh, do um, to see that this consent order is basically uh, enforced and not allow the uh, Martin uh, administration to um, condone, uh, you know, its evisceration. And then I'll finally point out um, that cleanup at Los Alamos could end up generating hundreds of high-paying jobs for a couple of decades um, in direct contrast to nuclear weapons programs that won't generate jobs. Uh, but again, what, what can you in the House do about uh, uh, promoting cleanup at Los Alamos and enforcing this consent order? Uh, so the consent order was signed by the state uh, actually during, I think it was Gary Johnson's term in office. It was, it was started and then it was modified under Richardson. Well, and, it, and it sets up goals when certain things have to be cleaned up in order for the permit that the state issues for Los Alamos to operate, to continue to operate. I met with Secretary Martin. He's the Secretary of the Environment Department. Uh, a few months ago, he came by to sort of say, hey, heads up, we're going to agree to waive the, these deadlines, and he said it was because the feds hadn't provided the funding uh, to Los Alamos for the cleanup, and he didn't want to uh, strip the operating permit and throw all these people out of work in, in, at Los Alamos. And in my view, I'm a lawyer, and I just said, you know, no one is ever going to turn up with the money unless the settlement agreement is enforced, and uh, I was not happy with the decision to uh, waive these deadlines. What we can do in the legislature is, um, so I'm the chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, we're planning to have a hearing on this, if I'm the chairman. <laughs> you know, if we lose the legislature, uh, the answer to what the House is going to do on this is a big fat goose egg. Um, but if, if we hold it and I stay on as chair of that committee, and those are both ifs, um, then the plan is going to be to basically bring them in and ask them to explain exactly what it is they're doing and why. Uh, there are ways if we can uh, pass. Now, the, and the question here is, if we do a memorial on this, it may have more of an impact than your standard memorial because even though they don't have the force of law, they do legally establish state policy. And so if you pass a memorial where the policy is that uh, these sorts of deadlines shall not be waived in settlement agreements, then there's the argument that they're not allowed to uh, waive those any further. Um, so those are two things that I've been thinking about that we might might look at, because I agree with you that we need to keep the keep the pressure on those guys to get it cleaned up. The size, you, know, you don't have to be you know, easily convinced, I guess. I'm trying to say the right way to say it. It's obvious to anybody, no matter whether you're the lab or uh, opponents of the lab, that the cleanup situation there is really Sucks. dire and we had a couple of hearings about the uh, Las Conchas fire where they came in and they described all the different identified underground sites of contamination. It's a real thing. I mean it's not you know sometimes people think with you know I get it all the time right I care about the environment and conservation they'll say ah oh, yeah you're just some you know tree hug and kook you know whatever and uh, <laughs> but this is real and uh, it's important to, to keep the feds feet to the fire. Well, on that same note, what about the 13 more tons of uh, nuclear grade, uh, weapons grade material they want to bring up there with the hearings? What's going on with that? I I don't know. I mean, I'm state I know, but person. It involves, I don't know about It involves our state if they haven't cleaned up what they have and they haven't pulled it off the ground and they want to take 13 more tons up there and there were hearings within the last month. I, again, I don't know the details. I'm, I just don't know. Okay, let's do, okay, let's get the, well, I'll talk to you. Okay, Mike. I guess uh, concerned about uh, present and future fracking, the hydraulic fracturing for gas, natural gas. I know uh, Vermont has passed a law protecting the uh, natural resources, the water, and basically protecting the nature of the state uh, from this sort of thing. Do you think there's any chance we could do something similar to so that frackers can't come in without 
with this idea of pro pro proprietary secret chemicals into our water. Right. Uh, it really upsets me. Um, so, you didn't hear the question. so the question is about fracking. Uh, they say that Vermont has passed a law. Did the law prohibit fracking, or did it just reinforce disclosure of, of the components? I'm not sure exactly. Okay. So there's basically, I don't know, I'm not aware of any state, doesn't mean there isn't one, I'm saying I'm not aware of any state that's actually prohibited the practice of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, lots of states, the, they deal with frack, does any, everyone, yes. oh, yeah. tense, okay, fracking is, this, they crack the rock with these high pressure fluids to release oil and gas and they can flow back to the surface. Um, about 95% of stuff that goes into fracking fluid is water, sand, soap, but the 5% that's left is claimed to be proprietary secrets by the manufacturers of the different uh, types of fracking fluid. The State Oil Conservation Commission by rule, uh, adopted a requirement that the components of fracking fluid used in New Mexico be disclosed on a website called Frac Focus, which is kind of like the national, I don't have any idea how this became the national <laughs> repository of this information, but it is, and uh, it's a legitimate website, and uh, all the stuff goes on there by regulation. The rule that was adopted to know uh, not to my surprise, by the Martinez, by the Martinez administration, has a huge uh, loophole so big you could drive an 18 wheeler through it, and that is anything that the company decides is proprietary doesn't have to be disclosed. <laughs> so you think, well, I mean, that's pointless. So, and this will give you a great example of the politics of this. Okay, you know, I say before sometimes I get labeled, you know, like e-golf, you know, as a lefty or crazy on conservation issues and stuff. I actually don't think I am. I think I'm, I think I'm in some ways the most conservative member of the legislature, right? Because I feel like you should, if you break it, you, you bought it. You should put things back the way they were when you found them, and you should pay for the consequences of the decisions you make, whether you're a business or a person. Now those, honestly, I think those are very conservative principles, but when I talk about them, they try and say that they're liberal, right? Which they're not. And it's the conservatives on the environment that are liberal because they want all the cleanup to be paid for by the government. And they don't want private people to have to pay for anything when it comes to cleanup or the costs associated with doing business. It's completely backwards. But So I introduced a bill. The, the regulation, as I said, I, in my view, is complete, not completely bogus, but it is, uh, to quote our vice president, it's, it's malarkey. It's a, bunch of, <laughs> it's a bunch of stuff. And um, so I put in a bill to have real disclosure of what's going into the ground in fracking. And it was a bill that was signed by the ultra-liberal uh, Rick Perry in Texas <laughs> and was passed by the super-liberal Texas state legislature. It was literally word for word the bill that was that's now law in Texas. And uh, I introduced it, and the industry showed up, and they freaked out, and they said I was going to kill drilling in New Mexico. Well, I said, well, it's what you're already doing right across the border in Texas. And often it's the Texas companies that you're hiring to come in and do the job, so it's not like they already know how to comply. And they said, well, you know, and so uh, the corporate, the oil company's contributions flowed to this committee, I mean, just like that, and it died. Uh, so I'm gonna try it again, and we'll see what happens. But you saw with Senate Bill 9, you know, Peter's bill to close the corporate loophole, how important it is to have people show up and help, and this is one where sh people showing up and helping could really make a big difference. Uh, we had a hearing, the first time ever there was a hearing in my committee uh, on fracking, and we started, we uh, brought by Skype uh, some professors from Duke and elsewhere that have done really good research on what's going on. Uh, we had people come down that, to talk about the study that they're doing up in Wyoming on uh, fracking fluid infiltration into water well, drinking water wells there. And it, basically what we learned is that it's, it's more complicated than just fracking is bad. That there's, there's certain things that you could do to make it uh, workable, but you need to have really strict regulation and make sure that uh, you're not fracking anywhere close to the surface. You know, there's kind of two categories of fracking, you know, and anyway, I don't want to, if anyone's interested, I can talk more about it. But it's, it's complicated, it's an interesting issue, and, but, but the first step is you got to get the disclosure, otherwise you never have the evidence that what's being put into the ground is ending up in someone's drinking glass. 
So that's the first step. Yeah.